Okay, good morning everyone and a happy new year to all. Welcome to the 21st CIRCA Online Learning and Virtual Engagement Set Webinar or what we call SOLVE Webinar. We are streaming to you live through Zoom and Facebook Live. This morning, together with the Philippine Rice Research Institute, the International Rice Research Institute, and the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines, we will try to solve food insecurity through biofortification. My name is Jerome Baradas from CIRCAS Research and Thought Leadership Department. I will be your moderator for this morning's webinar. To open today's learning session, may I call on Dr. Nova Ramos, head of CIRCA's Training for Development Unit under the Education and Collective Learning Department. Dr. Nova? Thank you, Jerome. A pleasant good morning to everyone. Our director, Dr. Glenn Brig Gregorio, sends his warmest greetings to all of you. He also extends his regards and gratitude to all the speakers, especially to his good friend, Dr. Howdy Bowie. CIRCA is very pleased to work with the Philippine Rice Research Institute, the International Rice Research Institute, and the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines in organizing this webinar focusing on addressing food and nutrition insecurity through biofortification. As you have may seen in our video, food and nutrition security is one of CIRCA's priority thrusts under our 11th five-year plan. We believe that having an accurate, highly credible, sound, timely, and reliable source of information is an indispensable part of our initiatives to accelerate agricultural transformation through agricultural innovation. With this in mind, CIRCA has and continues to work with various partners in creating knowledge sharing opportunities that empowers our stakeholders to understand science-based solutions and make informed decisions that can potentially usher in positive change in their lives. We sincerely hope that through this activity, we will be able to improve public understanding and acceptance of biofortification and its potential benefits in contributing to food and nutrition security and improving the quality of life of many in the Philippines and beyond. We look forward to an engaging learning session with all of you, and we do hope you'll stay with us until the end of this webinar. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Dr. Nova. The short video shown earlier has given you a glimpse about CIRCA and what we do. CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government and the campus of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. This of webinar is CIRCA's immediate response to the emerging impacts of the COVID-19 global pandemic on food security by maximizing the use of information and communication technology platforms to inform, educate, share evidence-based solutions and tested technologies as well as best practices on the ground. If you are new to this webinar, this is actually the 21st webinar since it was launched last April 28. For your information, this is the first solved webinar for 2021. So quite a, a historic uh, morning for us here. Before we proceed to our online conversation this morning, please allow me to just quickly go over some very interesting statistics gathered from the last SOL webinar last November. So this was on leadership conundrums. As you may see, majority of our online participants were female. It also shows that almost 200 individuals tuned in via Zoom, while more than 400 were following the discussion through CIRCA's Facebook page. We are also happy to note that we've had online attendees not only from the Philippines, but also from Cambodia, Canada, Indonesia, Thailand, Timor-Leste, the United States, and Vietnam. Before we begin, allow me to show you this morning's program and to read you some reminders. Okay, you, you are seeing here the program. 
So we have Dr. Luis, Dr. Perenio, and Dr. Ordonio will be our speakers for this morning. For those of you who are tuned in via Circa's Facebook page, you may type your questions in the comment section. Kindly indicate your location and your country of origin and your country of origin. If you are tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A box, which you would find in the menu bar on your screen. Kindly indicate your location as well as your country of origin. I will verbally convey your questions to our speakers and hopefully we will be able to cover as many as we can in the time remaining. Please be clear when you are posing a question to a specific presenter or if it is a general question that anybody can respond to. We will do our best to get as many questions as possible during the open forum. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available on Circa's Facebook page and YouTube channel. Today's presentations will also be available on Circa's website at www.circa.org. The slides shown during the past webinars have already been posted there. For your social media posts, especially on insights or takeaways from this webinar, please use the hashtag CircaSolve. If you have issues or experiencing technical difficulties with the Zoom online platform, please contact us at solve at circa.org. Let us now begin our learning session. Our first speaker is Dr. Howard Audi Ruiz, an economist whose work has focused on agriculture, nutrition outcomes, and reducing micronutrient malnutrition, also known as hidden hunger. He is the founder and former director of, of Harvest Plus, board chair of the Micronutrient Forum, Emeritus Fellow at IFPRI, and 2016 World Food Prize Laureate for his pioneering work on biofortification. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Howdy Buiz. Hello, Jerome and everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody and uh, greetings from our home here in Los Banos. Um, I'll play my presentation. I've pre-recorded my presentation and so it'll just play for 20 minutes and then I'll, I'll be back on live. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today about the role of agriculture and human nutrition in general and the specific niche and promise for biofortification in particular. I will start by delving into the background of what has been happening in agriculture for the past six decades and how this has affected diets. Next, I will talk about the comparative advantages and progress made for biofortification in the context of various nutrition smart interventions that can be taken in the agricultural sector. I will close with some remarks about the potential contribution of golden rice to vitamin A intakes in the Philippines. The fundamental cause of widespread mineral and vitamin deficiencies is that the poor cannot afford to buy sufficient vegetables, fruits, pulses, and animal products. The result is poor dietary quality. This slide shows the broad trend of what has been happening in agriculture over the past six decades in LMICs. Population has been growing rapidly represented by the blue bar. Cereal production represented by the orange bars has more than kept pace with population growth. There was a concerted effort to raise cereal yields. This is referred to as the green revolution, which depended heavily on increased fertilizer use. However, the broad range of non-staple foods did not experience the same increases in productivity. This is represented by the green bars. Pulses are only one example. Over this period, cereal prices declined significantly and non-staple food prices rose sharply. For India, for example, the chart shows that cereal prices declined by 40%, then have gone back up somewhat. 
However, and this is the main point I want to make about food prices, again, as shown for price data for India, non-staple food prices have doubled, nearly tripling in some cases. These same trends have occurred in the Philippines, although I don't have the data to show today. These tables, data for Bangladesh and the Philippines, show the resulting dietary patterns which are typical of all LMICs. Cereal consumption is high to keep from going hungry, the same level of intake across income groups. Intakes of non-staple plant foods increase somewhat with income. Animal product intakes are relatively low because they are the most expensive sources of calories, but percentage increases rise sharply with income. The foods represented by the green and red rows are the most dense in bioavailable minerals and vitamins, but intakes of minerals and vitamins are too low to meet requirements, even for the higher income groups. Simulation shows what happens to diet when all food prices rise 50% and income does not change. This beginning chart before the food price rise, using the Bangladesh data in the previous slide, shows total expenditures about equally divided between food staples, non-staple foods, and expenditure for non-food items. Typical of the poor, about two-thirds of total income is spent on food. Now you see what happens when food prices rise. The poor protect from going hungry by spending more for food staples and must lower their intakes for non-staple foods and even expenditures for non-food items. In this simulation, women's iron intakes declined by 35%. How to address the problem of hidden hunger caused by poor dietary quality. The nutrition community began with programs to provide supplements and food fortification, which filled the gaps but did not directly treat the underlying problem of poor quality diets. For example, 10 billion Vitamin A supplements have been given out over the past 20 years to preschool children, saving millions of lives. The cost is $1 to $2 per supplement. Countries must continue to spend year after year for supplements and food fortification. A comparative advantage of biofortification is that, unlike supplementation and commercial fortification, Recurrent costs are low once nutrient-dense varieties have been developed through agricultural research in a central location, then can be transferred for adaptation in country after country. This slide shows costs per daily saved for a wide range of interventions. The dark green and light green lines are for biofortification, which predominate at the left-hand side of the diagram where costs are lowest. Biofortification is highly cost effective, although many types of interventions are needed to fully address the problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. This simple stylistic diagram makes the point that it is much more cost effective and sustainable for agriculture to supply a higher percentage of minerals and vitamins that people need at affordable prices as represented by the green shaded portion of the rectangles, which represent total mineral and vitamin requirements. As we look to the future, we can break down the specific activities to be undertaken within agriculture into two broad groups. First, those activities which focus on food staples, which must increase the density of minerals and vitamins. Consumers already eat maximum amounts of food staples. Second, those activities which focus on non-staple foods must seek to increase the quantities eaten. Fundamentally, the second strategy is only possible if incomes can be increased and food prices can be lowered. Both broad strategies need to be pursued simultaneously. Food staples are not dense in minerals and vitamins. However, the absolute intake of minerals and vitamins from food staples is the result of multiplying quantities consumed times the density. The first term in this multiplication, quantities consumed of food staples, is a high number. Thus, as this slide shows, milled rice in the Philippines provides a very significant proportion of a wide range of minerals and vitamins in diets. 
In fact, no single food in the Philippines provides more nutrients than rice. The objective then within the substrategy of focusing on food staples is to increase densities. I myself have worked for more than 25 years to promote and implement a strategy of biofortification through plant breeding. This picture shows a deep orange maize developed through conventional plant breeding, which is high in vitamin A. Africans eat white maize, which has no vitamin A, but vitamin A deficiency is widespread. The orange mazes are high yielding and sell for the same price as white maize. Getting Africans to substitute orange maize for white maize in their diets will go a long way toward eliminating vitamin A deficiency at no extra cost to consumers. Several types of biofortified crops are now released in 40 countries and grown by at least 10 million farm households. Some have more iron, some have more zinc, some have more vitamin A. This map simply shows the 63 countries where releases already have been approved or are in testing for release. Biofortification is truly a global activity. You cannot read the detail in the chart, which is available on the Harvest Plus website and which shows which crops are released and in testing in all 63 countries. The statistics include orange sweet potato varieties developed and disseminated through the International Potato Center, which is not part of Harvest Plus. For example, two varieties of high zinc wheat are released in Pakistan. Data in the table at the top of the slide shows that plant breeding is a stepwise process with zinc densities climbing over time in the breeding pipeline rising from 36 to 38 to 40 milligrams per kilogram. Under an assumption of 20% bioavailability, zinc wheats currently provide an extra 25% or so of the estimated average requirement. And this will rise over time with continued breeding. According to a recent blog in DevEx by Lynn Brown of Harvest Plus, quote, if all wheat consumed in Pakistan's Punjab province were zinc enriched, the cost of a nutritious diet for an adolescent girl would fall by 25%, end quote. This is because of the price equality of biofortified varieties, more zinc for the same price. Moving now to the topic of scaling up of biofortified crops. This is an older map which tries to convey all the previous detail in one slide. 340 crop varieties have been released in low and middle income countries. Biofortified crops are being grown by a minimum estimate of 10 million farm households globally. Harvest Plus is now striving to make the numbers of producers and consumers of biofortified crops much higher in the hundreds of millions. For example, zinc rices have been available in Bangladesh for more than five years now. Eight varieties have been released, all highly productive and profitable, filling different varied niches in production patterns and consumer preferences. Harvest Plus estimates that 9% of Bangladeshi rice farmers now grow zinc rice. Not all farm households who receive zinc rice seeds permanently grow zinc rice. This is a pattern typical of diffusion for new crop varieties. The previous slides refer to work using conventional plant breeding. Use of transgenic techniques, popularly referred to as GMOs, offers opportunities to multiply the benefits of biofortification. This slide shows that iron and zinc density may be greatly increased in milled rice over what is possible with conventional plant breeding. The height of the two leftmost Yellow and blue bars in each chart show the iron and zinc densities that may be achieved using transgenics. The dashed red lines show it is possible using conventional plant breeding. The green line shows densities in current varieties of milled rice. Combine this with golden rice and transgenic biofortified rice may contain high densities of vitamin A, iron and zinc. Rice, of course, is the most widely eaten food staple globally. Before closing on the topic of food staples, let me make two further background points. 
First, it is important to note that plant breeding over the past several decades has focused on yield, which gives higher starch content without regard to nutrient content. This graph for wheat shows a historical 10 milligrams per kilogram decline in iron and zinc density. The trend is in the wrong direction. Second, it is important to note that there is a wealth of evidence now in the nutrition literature that increasing the density of vitamin A, iron, and zinc in food staples improves micronutrient status and demonstrates even that functional outcomes are improved, such as less sickness and better cognitive and work performance. The zinc content in wheat in this nutritional study undertaken in India was improved through fertilizers. Mothers and their children who consumed the high zinc wheat had fewer episodes of illness than mothers and their children who consumed the regular non-biofortified wheat. In a speech on the occasion of World Food Day, October 16th this year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi dedicated 17 biofortified varieties of eight crops to the nation to celebrate the establishment of the Food and Agricultural Organization 75 years ago in 1945. According to Indian media reports, the national government intends to scale up production of biofortified crop varieties and integrate them in government support programs, such as midday meals for school children, to reach the most vulnerable population groups. More details on this material can be found in a review paper recently published by the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology. The internet links are given here. A paper was recently published in Nature Communications on multiplying the efficiency and impact of biofortification through metabolic engineering. Again, the internet links are given here. For more details on these matters, I now have a personal website, nutra-agri-perspectives.com. I do not have time to discuss strategies for non-staple foods in any detail. However, this diagram brings together and summarizes my views on staple and non-staple food approaches to improving dietary quality, the two rows in the diagram. The columns distinguish between whether improved mineral and vitamin intakes rely on ever-present profit and price incentives, what I call indirect behavior change, the first column, or whether nutrition education is an important component of success, what I call direct behavior change, the second column. I am a proponent of the indirect behavior change approaches. Success in the second column depends on minimizing direct behavior change. For example, Africans must change behavior in switching to orange maize in place of white maize. But for the same price, families get more vitamin A in their diets and indirect economic incentive, more for the same price. The same economic incentives will hold for golden rice. Because golden rice is high yielding, it will sell for the same price as commonly consumed non-biofortified white rice. I will close by making a few remarks about the potential contribution of golden rice to vitamin A intakes in the Philippines. I show this slide again to emphasize that current varieties of rice contain zero vitamin A. However, for a wide range of nutrients, the contribution of rice to total intakes in the Philippines is already quite substantial. This slide shows vitamin A intakes in the Philippines by Wealth Quintile and Broad Food Group. Note that vitamin A intakes rise sharply with income. This is because the primary contribution to vitamin A intakes is from animal source foods, whose consumption rises sharply with income. Pork and chicken livers provide up to 30 to 35% of total vitamin A intake. Vegetables and fruits provide some vitamin A, but a low percentage. Foods commercially fortified with vitamin A are found in the energy giving and miscellaneous food categories. Their contribution to total intakes is very low. The prevalence of vitamin A deficiency for children under 13 years of age declines sharply with income, 
which is consistent with the significant increase of vitamin A intakes from animal sources. Although this does not prove causality, such causality is highly plausible. Regression analysis is possible with FNRI data to further understand and elucidate the magnitudes of the apparent high correlations. This slide reinforces a point made earlier in the presentation. Food expenditures are concentrated in the energy giving foods first to keep from going hungry. Rice consumption is constant across wealth quintiles. Wheat consumption increases somewhat with income. At the margin, consumers spend for expensive animal source products as their incomes increase. 100 grams of milled golden rice provides approximately 100 retinol activity equivalents before cooking. On average, per capita consumption of milled rice in the Philippines is 300 grams per day. Thus, on any given day, the golden rice is substituted for non-biofortified rice. 300 retinol activity equivalents are added per person to the family diets at no extra cost. For the lowest quintile, this would represent nearly a doubling of vitamin A intakes from their present estimate level of 335 retinol activity equivalents. Rice is the perfect food vehicle for biofortification. The poor eat large quantities and are disproportionately benefited. In closing, on one of my visits to FAO headquarters in Rome, relatively recently I was waiting to meet someone in the main lobby. I noticed a small plaque on the wall and went over to read it. Here is what it said. In this building, 16th of October, 1945, so 75 years ago, representatives of 44 nations met and established the Food and Agricultural Organization, first of the new United Nations agencies. Thus, for the first time, nations organized to raise levels of nutrition and to improve production and distribution of food and agricultural products. I thought, wow, 75 years ago, the policymakers mentioned nutrition first and agricultural supply second. What has happened in the meantime? There is still much work to do to convince those working in agriculture to give high priority to nutrition objectives. So thanks everyone. And um, I look forward to the discussion that will follow the presentations. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Howdy. I would like to encourage everyone to post your questions via the Q&A box for those who are in Zoom or the comment section for those joining us through Facebook. Uh, Dr. Howdy has started with a wonderful discussion on, on giving us a picture of food staples and how to increase uh, their nutrition and how it can benefit us. I encourage you to be part of later discussion. Our next speaker is Dr. Martin R. Pareno. Dr. Martin is a licensed physician and public health practitioner with a strong background on food security and nutrition program, both in emergency and development context. Formerly under the Department of Health's Doctors to the Barrios program, assigned to one of the most remote island municipalities in the country, and worked as a rural health physician and nutrition action officer. Later, he joined the DOH Health Emergency Management Bureau, then the Action Against Hunger International, a Span uh, Spanish-based international NGO, and now with the UN World Food Program as the OIC of the program unit and activity manager for the nutrition and food security related activities. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Martin Padeno. Hello, many thanks, Jerome, and good morning to all our colleagues who are here. Uh, my respect also to my fellow uh, resource persons for this morning. I'm very glad uh, that uh, WFP was invited to also share with you our experience with regards to our study called the Field and Nutrient Gap. It is very timely, active, and related to the objective of this session for today. So allow me to go through my presentation. This is actually also related and linked to 
the one presented by Dr. Howdy, but it's really more on the findings in the Philippines and of the other studies done in the other countries where WFP is doing the field and nutrient gap. But I will not deal so much on the biofortification. I will speak of fortification as a whole and the findings of this uh, study. Okay, so my outline of presentation is just to give you the general overview of what the field and nutrient gap is, the significant findings for the Southeast Asia and particularly for the Philippines, and some practical solutions to address the nutrient gap. As you can see in your uh, slide there, you will see that these are the different countries in the world where WFP conducted the field and nutrient gap since 2016. And in the Philippines, we did it in 2018. As you can see, there are about 30 countries and the result of that study actually was very useful in designing plans and programs of the different countries to achieve food security and nutrition. Actually, this study is using the linear programming and particularly for the Philippines, we use the 2015 data from FNRI on the top 100 most commonly consumed food in the different regions of the country, including the price index during that time. So uh, probably you will think about, oh, that was in 2015. So what will happen? What happened now in 2020? Well, definitely the price actually of the nutritious food has uh, exponentially increased. But this one, uh, what we did was to use a model of one household with a child age 12 to 23 months, a school ch uh, age child around 6 to 7 years old, an adolescent girl, lactating woman, and an adult man. So the most common findings in Southeast Asia actually are the following. It's pretty, uh, pretty much the same more or less. The findings were more on there is a high cost of nutritious diet and that might have been the reason why people cannot afford it and that re uh, results to high magnitude of undernutrition particular standing in those um, uh, regions of the of the of those countries in the region second is there is also a high childhood stunting wasting and even micronutrient deficiency and the cost for pregnant women and adolescent girls are really high and this is very important particularly in designing programs within the first 1000 days because whatever we give to pregnant mo mothers and lactating women are very important for the outcome of the pregnancy and to prevent um, stunting and micronutrient deficiency as a whole. The other fi common finding is that there is a low infant and young child feeding practices in those countries. And what's very particular about the Philippines is that the minimum wage wasn't enough actually to address the cost of the nutritious diet. Later, there's a slide which I'm going to present to you to show uh, the minimum wage. Another finding was that there's a lot of uh, local practices that affect nutritious diet, like example, the norms, the taboos, etc. Here I'm showing to you the, the cost of nutritious diet in different countries. Examples are in Asia, Africa, and America. So it's really a big, uh, it's a huge range, you know, particularly in Pakistan. It's very high at $15 per day, per person per day, um, most likely because of their current condition. For the Philippines, it's around $4.12 per day. In Africa, we have some examples from Mozambique and from Guatemala as well. Now, the most common recommendations from these findings are really focused on fortification, particularly in uh, the fortification of our staple food. Like, for example, in the case of Cambodia, it says here that fortification of uh, staple food in the market is really very important to improve um, the nutrition situation of the area. Lao PDR also mentioned about fortifying rice, fortifying oil, and uh, the combination of both, and also mentioned in timor less findings. But apart from that, there are some other practical solutions to address the nutrient needs of the population, and those are listed also in your screen. But I will just focus more on the fortification uh, component. Particularly in the Philippines, there's a huge information we, that we can actually get from it. Now, there are about 10 findings, but I would like to focus only on those in orange highlights, particularly message 1, 2, 3, 6, 8, and 9, because this has something to do with the fortification and our discussion today. First is that while almost all households would be able to afford a diet, energy diet in that sense, but only a third would be able to afford the diet that meets the nutritional needs. The next slide will, show, will tell you 
that in 2018 survey, when you look at uh, the screen on your right side, the cost of energy only diet, meaning say the staples like rice, uh, um, maize, etc., it will only cost about 108 pesos per day. And everyone can afford to buy that. But when you look at nutritious diet, it has doubled uh, the cost to 206 pesos per day or equivalent to $4.2 per day. And when you look at that, only about a third of the households can afford that. Maybe that's the reason why micronutrient deficiency and malnutrition is still very prevalent in the country. But what happened when an emergency happened, particularly during pandemic, the review would show that the pandemic actually um, potentially increased the cost of the nutritious diet to around 252 pesos or about $5.25 per day. So we just imagine the support coming from the national government is only this much. But then, can they sustain that? Because largely, about 45% of the work, uh, the, the, the working house in the Philippines um, did not have uh, or were retrenched because of the pandemic. Specifically, when you look at the whole map of the Philippines, you will see that regions in red are the areas where non-affordability of nutritious diet is very, very high ranging from 18 to 59 percent or at the average of 32 percent for the whole country and these are the same regions where stunting also is very high when you look at the minimum wage particularly in the national capital region it's not really sufficient uh, to buy a nutritious diet you will see here that the cost of energy only diet is about 133 pesos and that is already equivalent to the 42 percent of the minimum wage of a family of five per day if you are going to allocate that amount for the minimum for the nutritious diet, it will even be over the 70% of your minimum wage. So this is a, a very good uh, advocacy actually to the government to maybe increase the minimum wage of the working sector towards its end. This one would show that there is really a high correlation of non-affordability to nutritious diet. Well, definitely. Um, it will give some idea that because people cannot afford nutritious diet, so definitely the diet is also very uh, insufficient to the different micronutrients that are important actually for, for growth and development of children. Let's go to message number two. So basically, breastfeeding rates, dietary diversity, and feeding practices of young children are really suboptimal. When you look at your slide, there is a very high minimum meal frequency. That's true because uh, Filipinos are fond of eating rice three times a day, even morning snacks, PM snacks, and even at night time. No? There's also midnight snacks. But when you look at the diversity, it's very, very low at 29%. When you combine both diet diversity and frequency, the minimum acceptable diet for these children aged 6 to 23 months is very, very low at 19%. It is highly um similar to the findings of the national nutrition survey of the fnri when you look at the different models looking at the cost of nutritious diet the cost of nutritious diet is around 11 pesos per day for uh for some of these children but then if you're going to provide them through social safety net some support like for example super cereal meals the Remo blend, which is actually developed by one of the technology adapters of FNRI. If you are going to pro provide children with LNS or lipid nutrient supplement, or even MAMSI, which is a local equivalent of LNS and some micronutrient powder, the cost of nutritious diet is 11%, but the rest of the other support that we can get can potentially decrease also the cost of nutritious diet to around that much in your, uh, in your slide. So meaning to say, if we are going to fortify or provide them with all of these support, then definitely the cost of the energy of the nutritious diet will be very low and everyone can afford to buy that. What is being reflected in your screen is that these amounts are the amounts that the families will just going to spend if they will be provided with nutritious diet by the government through social safety net. Say for example, if the government will provide them super cereal, then they were just going to utilize only or spend about six pesos per day for a child aged 6 to 23 months to uh, achieve 
the requirement of a child. The same is true with Raymond Blend. And down the line. Next slide. Meeting the nutritional needs of adolescent girls and pregnant and breastfeeding women would cost the household the most. I think most of you would already know that the requirement of adolescent girls and pregnant lactating women is very, very high or very high during that period of, uh, of growth and development. You will see here in your slide that this pregnant lactating women would consume about 27% of the total proportion of a family's income in one day. Uh, and even adolescent girls at 33% because, you know, they're growing. So definitely they need to, uh, we need to invest on them so that their continued growth and development will be sustained, ready for possible pregnancy because that definitely uh, they will be become mothers later on. Next, if we're going to provide supplements to adolescent girls and lactating women, you will see that the cost of nutritious diet for them is around 81 pesos for an adolescent girl in one day. But if we're going to provide them with super cereal, iron folic acid, and even micronutrient tablet, it will even decrease to 52, 55, and 40 uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as so forth. The same is true with lactating women. So what is the message here? If the social safety net program is really uh, well implemented, definitely it will allow households to afford a nutritious diet. Next slide would tell us that the policy in the Philippines is really focused on rice self-sufficiency with low demand on vegetables and do not incentivize agriculture diversification. As you will see here, just like the other countries in Southeast Asia, Philippines is also a large consuming country with regards to, to a staple food like rice. No, But then in... The Biostat 2016 data, the Philippine production was more on sugar cane, followed by rice, 468 uh, grams per day, and then coconuts, and only less on the production of vegetables and fruits. And these are very important food, which can provide us with micronutrients. And then, the home production of nutritious food can reduce cost of produce is consumed. So this is one of the things that we need to do. We need to intensify our advocacy towards homegrown school feeding, backyard gardening, etc. Because it will uh, potentially decrease the cost of nutritious diet from 165 pesos per family per day to 148 pesos if you consume it yourself. This slide would tell you that if you are not planting anything, if you're just buying it from outside, the non-affordability of nutritious diet is about 59%. But if they will plant and consume their produce, only about 45% cannot afford the nutritious diet. If they will consume it and sell the surplus or report it at the price, in the market price, it will even reduce the non-affordability to 24%. But if you plant it, consume it, and then you sell the surplus at the market price, meaning to say, no middlemen who are potential potential to increase the the food price everyone actually can afford the nutritious diet the next slide would tell us that during natural disasters and emergency preparedness plans the programs and monitoring tools need to be strengthened to include nutrition as you will see here during emergencies in the philippines the department of social welfare and development or dswd is providing family food back to households there is a policy uh, on that, and there is uh, some technical review about what's going to be the content of the family food pack because it will address definitely the required need of a family of five uh, for two days. However, in the reality, what is being provided is not attuned actually to what is in the policy. So you will see here a table that would tell us the components. Now on your left side, uh, this includes rice, and supposedly it should have been iron fortified. Corned beef, sardines, laing, this is actually um, a vegetable that is preserved in can and pinakbet, multi-nutrient growth mix and instant coffee in three in one. What is being provided in actuality is the not fortified rice and some of those like corned beef, sardines and instant. So there's a lot of other items which are not provided in actuality because of the availability and the problem with supply chain. But what is written in the memo is the one on your right side. Looking at it, 
the family food pack actually has a potential to improve the, the nutrient intake of the population. You will see there that if you are going to modify the food pack, it can even increase the energy and some of the micronutrients um, significantly. But the message here is that if the government will not provide it according to the policy, definitely it cannot provide what is needed by, by the household in the affected areas of the calamity. You will see here also a slide that will tell you that the cost of the fish's diet for a family is 219. If you will provide them uh, the family food pack outline or based from the policy, it can decrease actually to 57%. So almost all, all, all households can, uh, ac can access nutritious or buy nutritious diet. But if it's not followed, the cost of diet can only decrease up to 132 pesos per day. Next is the existing school meals program in the Philippines can provide children with nutritious food. So currently, this is part of the social safety net program of the government. We have school feeding uh, sponsored by the Department of Education and the supplementary feeding by the Department of Social Welfare and Development for uh, the preschool children. It really has a potential to decrease the cost of nutritious diet, say, for example, for preschoolers from 22 to 19 pesos and 25 to 18 pesos for the Department of Education. But the findings of the WFP FNG is that as most of these children or majority of these children in the far-flung far -flung areas go home on empty stomach or sleep at night on empty stomach, we need to ensure that the school means program is the most nutritious food that they eat in one day because sometimes they just only eat once a day. Sometimes they bring with them their other um, siblings just to, take, to partake in, in the school feeding program because there's nothing to be eaten um, at home. Well, based on the policy of the school feeding program, it, it can actually meet the one-third of the daily energy and nutrient need. But what we want is to increase it a little bit to 50% because as I, as I mentioned, it has to be the most nutritious food in one day. And if you will see there uh, the line in, in orange, that's what is being recommended by WFP at, at 50%. So if we're going to look at 50%, majority of the micronutrients will not be met like vitamin A, uh, no, vitamin vitamin B1, pantothenic acid, folic acid, calcium, iron, and even zinc, which are very important for growth and development. Um, for my last few slides, I'm sh going to show to you WFP's uh, pilot program for the iron fortified rice through school feeding in BARM. Well, there are some other studies done in the past already about uh, iron fortified rice through school feeding, but the objective of this one is really to make a case that indeed uh, fortification of rice can be done locally and we, need, we don't need to import it from outside because it's very costly. And we know that there's an existing food fortification law and national school feeding law, but then the implementation in the Philippines is really not very good. And up to now, only about 2% of the Philippines rice is, uh, is iron fortified. And this also supports the objective of the Zero Hunger Task Force and the Enhanced Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty that was created by the presidential uh, order to address food security and malnutrition in the Philippines. So based from our study, these are our findings. There are already policies and standards in place and it just needs some updating, like for example, mixing ratio, the kernel size, and some of the machinery. There are already existing kernel producers in the country, so why won't make use of that? And then there are already equipment available in the country. The, the, the government already provided through the OST, I mean, and NFA provided different machineries to the different regions in the country, which we can actually tap. And we just need to have some large scale demand generation in order for us to uh, ensure that this can be scaled up in the whole country. And definitely, it's very important to make some behavioral change communication towards that end. So my take-home message is that, one, fortification really works, and it reduces the cost of nutritious diet that can contribute to the reduction of malnutrition, particularly standing. It can increase the affordability of nutritious diet, and as, soon, as long as it is uh, included in social safety net program, and it can be scaled up. So we need to just scale up existing practical solutions, but definitely continue with the different innovations. 
So that's all from my end. Thank you very much. And I uh, would like to listen to your queries and questions later on during the Q&A session. Good morning and thank you. Thank you and good morning, Dr. Martin Pereño. Thank you for giving us a picture of what's happening in the Philippines when it comes to uh, the need for biofortification as well as the different uh, government initiatives that uh, aims to address these things. Our last speaker is currently a senior science research specialist at PhilRISE and has been conferred the rank of scientist one by the, by the Civil Service Commission of the Philippines and the Department of Science and Technology last May 2019. He currently serves as the project leader of the Healthier Rice Project at PhilRISE, a collaborative project with Erie. This project aims to produce beta-carotene-enriched golden rice and high iron and zinc rice to address the problem of micronutrient deficiencies in the country. Dr. Ardonia's fields of interest include plant genetic modification and gene editing. His works have already been published in numerous international journals. He is also involved by the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines or NCBP in developing the first ever policy of the Philippines on products of plant breeding innovations, which include gene editing. Again, I'd like to encourage you to keep your questions coming for an uh, engaging discussion after Dr. Ray's presentation. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Ray Ordonio. So thank again, you. thank you so much, Jerome, for that introduction. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you so much for our organizers for and about agriculture and nutrition in this webinar. And as you know, nutrition is a very important topic nowadays that we're still in the pandemic condition. And nutrition is also one of the goals of the Department of Agriculture Food Security Framework in that they aim to provide not just food, but also safe and nutritious food. And talking about uh, safe and nutritious food today, I will be talking about golden rice, particularly the regulatory progress leading to pilot scale deployment. So let me start my presentation by showing to you the state of nutrition in the Philippines. Did you know that Filipinos have the second shortest average height in ASEAN and we are ninth worldwide in terms of stunting and also tent for wasting. And did you know that these symptoms are because of micronutrient deficiencies or hidden hunger? And among the reasons for stunting are vitamin A deficiency or, or it could be zinc deficiency. And in the Philippines, 16.9% or about 2 million children below five years old have vitamin A deficiency one of the reasons for the stunting. And these account for 25.8% of the children living in poorest households. The problem with vitamin A deficiency is that this can lead to reduced immunity, to poor eyesight, and also problems about cognitive development. And since the development of young children are at stake in the future, and in the macro level, this can result in reduction in productivity of the population plus reduced quality. Now relate this to the role of rice in the Filipino diet. In the Philippines, Filipino households spend almost 30% of their daily food cost on rice, which comprises almost 40% of the daily diet. And the rice budget and consumption is highest in the poorest households. And rice is also a top source of energy among all age groups. So this just shows us that, that poor households can mostly afford only rice and they use it as a source of calories. But then rice has fewer micronutrients or they lack some important micronutrients. And this can lead to micronutrient deficiency if uh, families or children are just taking in sufficient amounts of carbohydrates from rice. And 
now that we know that there is a problem about vitamin A deficiency in the Philippines and that rice is an important source of calories for Filipinos, this is a staple food among Filipinos, this makes golden rice the promising tool for addressing the problem of malnutrition by being a complementary solution. This means that golden rice should be taken in along with other sources of vitamin A in the diet. Now, golden rice is a genetically modified rice that contains beta carotene, which is converted by the body to vitamin A as uh, needed. And uh, this aims to provide 30 to 50% of the estimated average requirement or ear for vitamin A for young children. And um, because rice is our staple food and we eat a lot of it, especially in the poor households, and that because poorer households can mostly afford rice, even a small increase in the micronutrient content in the grain could have a significant impact on human health. Now, golden rice, in terms of its development and the regulatory process it is going through, has gone through a lot through the years. And in this slide, I'm showing you the bird's eye view of the regulatory process. This all begins in the laboratory where the transgenic events are generated. And the lead event is later on selected. And the lines of this lead event are tested in a confined test condition. In the Philippines, this is under the purview of the Department of Science and Technology. Then uh, we used this stage to gather data on food safety and also human and animal health. Then later on, the selected lines from the confined test are forwarded to the multi-location field trial. And this is actually for getting environmental safety data. And the next stage is about regulatory safety assessment, wherein we consolidate all of our data and create a food commercial propagation application for golden rice which will be submitted or to be submitted to the Department of Agriculture, BPI. So this just shows you that extensive, extensive research rather has been done on golden rice and the research protocol is satisfying local and international regulations on food safety and also health. Now we gathered also permits or approvals different institutions on food safety like the Australia New Zealand FGSANS, Food Safety Australia New Zealand or Food Standards Australia New Zealand rather and the US FDA plus Health Canada and in the Philippines we also got a nod from the DABPI in terms of food safety and after the regulatory application is approved, that's the time GR2E or golden rice will be released as a common variety or like any other ordinary varieties. And this will undergo then varietal registration under NSIC and the ABPI. And that will later on undergo deployment plus uh, some nutritional study and market test. And uh, Another idea we can get from this is golden rice is as safe as conventional rice varieties as stated by the different regulators I mentioned earlier. And it's important that we have a strategic approach for GR delivery and uptake. And this is the topic for this next slide. Now, in order to have this strategic approach for GR, GR delivery, we are considering farmer and consumer preference. The GR trait is being introduced to popular local varieties and it can be grown just like ordinary rice. And another goal is to demonstrate bioavailability and potential efficacy of golden rice. And uh, beta carotene levels in GR after cooking can provide 30% of ear. And that the development of appropriate delivery strategy is uh, also of paramount concern. And we have ongoing research now for pilot scale deployment in the Philippines. Now for our current regulatory steps, 
we have just submitted our application for commercial propagation of GR2E to DABPI this October. And we have posted the public information sheet required into dailies in November. And right now the 60 day public comment period is ongoing and this will last until January 19, 2021. And with regards to this application, I would like to get your support in our application. Uh, we hope that uh, you can submit letters of support to DABPI. And uh, we would like to have all the support we can get. So we, you can also participate in the social media network in our Instagram account, Facebook, and Twitter. So for more information about the Golden Rice Project, you may please contact Dr. Ronan G. Sagado, our Head Development Communication Division, and yours truly, Reynante Ordonia, the lead of the Golden Rice Project at Phil Rice. So thank you so much, and I would like to entertain questions later on about Golden Rice. Thank you, Dr. Ray. It's now time to for our uh, open forum. Let to encourage everyone to already post your questions via the Q&A box, as well as the comment section uh, for those who are following us through Facebook. There are questions, there are comments requesting for the for copies of the slides. Huh? It will be available at our website, www.circa.org, as mentioned earlier during the webinar. So we have a question here addressed to all of our speakers. Um, have there been studies conducted to explore community perceptions, acceptance or non-acceptance uh, about biofortified crops? If yes, what were the results? So the community acceptance of products of biofortification. Perhaps we can do it in the same order, Dr. Howdy first, and then Dr. Martin, and then Dr. A. Dr. Howdy? Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, before, uh, so biofortified crops have now been available in several countries for many years. Um, but before we did the first releases in the first countries, we, we conducted, um, you know, studies, seeing if people like the taste, um, you know, what the consumers thought about the varieties. And basically, you know, those studies showed that they, you know, that they accepted, the, you know, they thought the biofortified crops tasted, you know, just the same or, or even better in some circumstances. So there was really, there was no, no blockage really. Um, and since then, you know, we've, we, but what's more important is that we have experience now, uh, like high iron beans in uh, Rwanda account for 20% of the supply already. They're high yielding. Um, and so if the basic food staple is beans in Rwanda and 20% of the supply, obviously they're well accepted. But I, but I think that the, the, really the key is the vitamin A crops because you change the color. So first you have to explain to people why the color change and then they understand. I think the, the important point is, is that the, the yellow and orange variety costs exactly the same as the white variety. So if you're a mother and you're worried about getting more vitamin A to your children, to your family, if you buy the orange variety, the biofortified variety for the same price, your family gets more vitamin A. So it's a very uh, attractive economic proposition. You get more for the same price. So then the, the only blockage is that they don't like the taste. And so far the Africans in the case of orange maize in Africa, actually the, the vitamin A, they can taste the difference, but it's a little bit sweeter. And actually the children like it because it's a little bit sweeter. So once once the taste is not a barrier and they understand why the color change, it's actually a nutrition benefit, then, it, then it's well accepted by the consumers and they ask for it and they want it. So it, it's a matter of getting up to a critical point where the word gets out that, hey, this, this orange yellow variety 
tastes good, it's the same price, and it's more nutritious. And then, and then it just takes off by itself. Uh, all things equal except for the the added uh, trait, and then right. they're good with it. And this is the experience in Africa. How about you, Dr. Martin? Uh, would you like to share uh, from your experiences? Yes, thank you, Jerome. Actually, Dr. Howie Bowie has more experience more than I do with regards to those studies. But what I can say perhaps is with regards to biofortification in the Philippines, I think there's none yet so far. But I know that ERE has started something. No? And in the last, in 2019, ERE together with uh, FAO and WFP already uh, made some um, talk about the distribution actually of biofortified zinc rice for production. And we distributed it to some of the beneficiaries of of FAO down in Maguindanao. But uh, as of yet, there's no current uh, study with regards to the acceptability towards that end. But with regards to fortification as a whole, like for example, in the case of iron fortified rice, I know that there are some studies in the Philippines, but it's more on the effectiveness, uh, more than the acceptability, but I think there are some few. Uh, I think some of our colleagues here who are listening uh, also would know about it. Um, but during our uh, field and nutrient gap, presentation actually we kind of made some little survey but it's really informal like serving iron fortified rice uh, to the um, participants during the presentation and they didn't know that it was actually iron fortified rice because the color was still white and the taste did not change actually and then after the the event happened we asked them so what was your reaction with regards to what you've just eaten like the rice and only then they know that it was actually iron fortified rice. So I think the, the most important point here is that we really have to make our efforts or innovations um, very practical in the sense that it doesn't change the quality of the rice so that we will encourage them more actually to, to uh, consume this one because definitely we Filipinos, we value white rice not just like the other Asian countries in, uh, within the region. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Have you personally tasted iron fortified rice? Yes. Uh, and uh, by experience, it's the same. It's no? just pretty much the same with a regular rice, actually. Is it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'd just like to clarify, right. is it uh, the same price or? Well, uh, it costs a little bit higher because one is that the demand is very low. But I think with the economy of scale, definitely later on, it will definitely decrease. Um, as of the moment, it will probably cost you around an additional of one to two pesos per kilogram, perhaps. But you get are the using the, yeah, and we are using the uh, the recent technology. Mm -hmm. uh, last, thank you, Dr. Martin. Now, Dr. Ray, uh, so with community perceptions. Uh, with regards to golden rice, we're still in the process actually of conducting pre-deployment activities and that include farm level, market level and consumer level surveys. And uh, re with regards to the acceptability, we have to have the actual products so that the consumers can taste them. And in that regard, it is good that we already have the food safety permit or the FFP permit last uh, December, 2019. And through that, we were able to initially conduct a preliminary sensory evaluation wherein our group tasted it blindfoldedly while being blindfolded. And then as a result, we were not able to discern really which is golden rice and which is the ordinary rice. And this is because the addition of the trait in golden rice does not really impart any taste difference or change in taste or in aroma. It's just a change of color, which I hope the Filipinos would love the golden color, just like star margarine effect. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ray. Uh, we have here a question from Alexander Morados. No? Biofortified food crops are produced to eradicate micronutrient deficiency among children in many developing nations in Asia and Africa. How are the governments of these nations uh, responding to biofortification programs of food crops? Well, it, uh, to some extent, it depends on the length of experience uh, 
and the amount of advocacy that's been done in the country. Uh, I, uh, India, I presented a slide in my presentation that showed Prime Minister Modi had, uh, had he'd made a national speech endorsing biofortified crops. So that was in 2020. I made my first trip to India to start uh, advocating for biofortified crops in 2005. And it was, uh, it was a hard sell in 2005. They didn't, we haven't even done the research. They hadn't developed the varieties. But over time, uh, as we worked with the scientists, we developed the crops and we've built the experience globally. You know, now, now the prime minister, it isn't that the prime minister is so aware, but of course the people that helped write his speech were talking to the agricultural policymakers and saying, what should we put in the speech? And they said, oh, the, you know, the biggest, hottest topic is biofortification. Let's put that in the speech. So, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's doing well. Uh, we introduced biofortified crops first in Africa because the pro vitamin A crops were the first ones to be released. And so, you know, particularly in the countries where we've worked, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, you know, it's now, it's, it's, it's part of government policy. And, um, and even the international organizations uh, such as the World Bank now, when they make agricultural loans to countries, they include components in their loans to help the scale up of biofortified crops. So the, uh, you know, and I, I presented a slide that we, had, we now are working in 63 countries with biofortified crops. So the momentum is really, is growing quite rapidly. I think, um... I saw in Dr. Martin's presentation how um, I, there is a memo from the DSWD, correct me if I'm wrong, that the food pack should have iron fortified rice. However, this is in writing, but it's more difficult to, to implement, right? Because of yes, the, the supply chain and the availability. And but even the demand. Least, and the, and the, demand, no? the policy is there. So, right. Thank you, Dr. Howdy and Dr. Martin. Uh, at least something is happening. Governments are realizing the importance and the benefits of uh, biofortification. Uh, we have a few questions kind of related no? from Meli Tenorio and then from one of our attendees from Sorsogon. Um, is uh, we saw that golden rice is not yet out, but uh, what is making golden rice uh, commercialization too long? No? Yeah, the journey to golden rice is indeed long, but uh, every step of the way, it ensures that uh, golden rice will eventually be safety. Uh, I mean, safe and efficacious. So. Sometimes it gets too long, but then with that, we can improve the product further. And uh, it's actually good that in the Philippines, we have a regulatory process that is strict and at the same time sound in terms of uh, protocols or safety standards. And I think it's a win-win condition for all of us that uh, in the long run, when golden rice is out, we can benefit with a product that is safe and nutritious and effective. Safe, safe nutritious and effective. I think that it's very much connected to the question of Julia Golioso Gubat no? asking if this the presentation you, you the flow you, you presented earlier is the standard procedure in the pH for all uh, crops. Uh, her question is, is it in use because golden rice is a GMO? Yes, in a way, because we have the rig rigorous regulatory framework in the Philippines for GMO crops, and that includes golden rice. And because we are taking paramount concern for safety, this regulatory framework is put in place in the Philippines. But you know, in the process of developing golden rice, we are adhering to local and international standards and we take pride in the rigor of our scientific research. Um, we have this question, um, let me read. 
what information should policymakers look should policymakers look at if they are considering implementing biofortification as a complementary intervention what information should the policymakers uh, consult or refer to if they would like to initiate biofortification interventions and I, I tried to I tried to present a lot of that information in the slide presentation. Um, the first point is is that it's very cost effective. The second point is that it's very sustainable in the long run. Uh, once the biofortified varieties are out in the food system, you use the same inputs. The cost is the same. Let me let me give an example. Uh, Carrots are not a carrots are not a big uh, consumption item in the Philippines, but Filipinos eat carrots. Carrots are orange. You naturally go and you you get vitamin A. Actually, carrots provide 30% of vitamin A in U.S. diets. Well, carrots used to be white and purple. There didn't used to be orange carrots, but people have forgotten that. So golden rice is the same idea. Once, once it's out in the system and it costs the same and it provides vitamin A in the diet and people realize uh, you know, what, the, what the advantage is to eating it, if you come back 20 years from now, it's probable that most of the rice will be orange. It seems, it seems strange to people now because they've grown up eating white rice. But once you, once you get over the barrier, um, you know, it tastes good. It's healthy. Why? Why would you buy? Why would you buy white rice when you don't get the vitamin A that you get from the orange rice? So that's the you know that's the that's the value proposition to the consumers, and that's what the what, what the policymakers should know. Um, the drawback the drawback is that it takes a long time. I mentioned I just mentioned that I I went to India in 2005. And now 15 years later, the varieties are developed and the prime minister is endorsing. Well, it takes a while. It takes a while to do the plant breeding and do the development. But now we're, we're past that. Golden rice varieties are high yielding. And they're available. And we just have to, we just have to get, past through, get past this one last regulatory step. And then the process of distribution can begin. A question, how does golden rice compare to the usual uh, high-yielding white rice varieties? Yes, that's a good question, Jerome. Um, golden rice is actually bred to be comparable with the ordinary rice. Actually, as of now, we have golden rice in the background of PSB RC82. And we all know that the PSBRC82 is one of the popular high yielding varieties we have in the Philippines in terms of eating quality and in terms of its uh, performance uh, for yield. And uh, with golden rice, the only thing different with that PSBRC82 is that the, the green is yellow. There is a golden yellow color in the grains. And that's indicative of the level of beta carotene in, in the grains. And apart from that, there is no other difference. It's everything similar. Mm -hmm. So that's also true when golden rice is, I mean, the trait is introgressed into other backgrounds or other popular high yielding varieties in the Philippines. Everything will be the same except for the green color. Mm -hmm. And also same with, with regards to the yield, there's no yield penalty. Oh, good. Uh, putting on my farmer's hat, I will be looking at, uh, if I produce golden rice, I'd look at uh, if there is yield penalty when it comes to it. But again, keeping my, my farmer's hat, does it entail additional production costs, fertilizer? Is it more susceptible? Yes, consistent with my answer earlier, it's basically all the same mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how we culture it, in terms of their response also to pests and diseases, in terms of the green mm -hmm. yield, and um, also in the market stage, the price will also be competitive because you didn't additional inputs in the first place. So everything will be just the same with the ordinary just rice. The so it's, it's going to be competitive. So at least that is taken care of. Now, 
Uh, we have, a, thank you, Dr. Ray. We have a question from Julie or July Limson. How can we avail of iron fortified rice for our school feeding programs? Now, it was mentioned earlier that uh, there are some difficulties procuring this, but uh, do we have leads to getting supply of iron fortified rice for our interventions? Okay, uh, hi Jerome, I'm going to take that question. Thank so you. right now, um, the good thing is that the national government is really interested in scaling up the iron fortified rice, as mentioned in the different key result areas and objectives of the interagency task force for zero hunger, which is being led actually by the office of the cabinet secretary and also of the enhanced partnership against hunger and poverty. While we are on the process of influencing the, them to scale it up, um, the most important thing is that if you need that, like the case of the Ministry of Basic Higher Technical Education in BARM, you just need actually to uh, submit your case to the National Food Authority, to the DSWD, and even to the NNC that you need this. And then part of our assistance actually to BARM is to link them up with the necessary government agencies like the FDA, uh, the NFA to do this and uh, provide them the list of suppliers of iron fortified rice and kernel in the Philippines. Right now, there is no avail large scale available iron fortified rice in the country as of yet. But there are some local suppliers of iron kernel. And what the agency would need to do is maybe through their procurement process, look for the supplier of iron fortified rice and uh, maybe look for the suppliers also of the local rice. And if I may suggest, uh, get it from the small scale farmers to help their livelihood as well. And then we can link you up with the FDA for the standards and following all of those policies and guidelines down the line. But I know that through the Enhanced Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty and the Interagency Task Force, this will be uh, taken into consideration. The objective of the Enhanced Partnership Against Hunger and Poverty actually is to provide support to the, the small-scale farmers and link them up to the different um, uh, supplementary feeding programs like the Department of Education School Feeding Program, the SWD, even the Department of Health, and the Bureau of Jail and Management. So what we want is there is a market ready for our small-scale farmers, and if they can provide those, and even our private sectors, if they can provide a very cheap kernel, then most likely we will be achieving what we want to do. And Jerome, if, um, if I may, I would like to add also some information with regards to the recent question with regards to what kind of information the government need in order to adapt biofortification. I think the most important there, from my point of view, because I, I worked with the local government before, is really to let them understand what the value of human capital and what their objective really is. And if they want to have a legacy to the government later on, when they die, at least people will will um, will think them, ah, this person really made some impact really in addressing food and nutrition security. They need to understand the nutrition situation in the Philippines. But I think us, as, as advocates, we need to make a very clear, simple, and um, very simple information for them to grasp actually, because this will create some momentum later on for them to adopt some certain policies and guidelines. I think one of the reasons why the Iron Fortified Rice Program in the Philippines did not fly, mainly because we change administration from time to time. And most of them actually really don't have some idea about what food security is. But now that because of the, of the pandemic, they already felt that indeed we really need to invest so much on food security and nutrition. And I think um, just in the case, in the case of the local government down there in Maguindanao, who actually accepted this uh, biofortified zinc rice, the first thing that they um, the, the first thing that they uh, they saw was actually that the yield was even higher as compared to the regular rice. Ooh. But they said, "How are we going to mass produce this one? Because we don't know yet what's going to be the support of the national government." So I think our our approach should be multi-level, advocate it at the national level at the same time to the local government unit, because if this two will connive, then definitely this will fly through. We'll have the balance between uh, the demand and supply and the support, the policy of the government. Um, I would just like to confirm, thank you, Dr. Martin. I'd just like to confirm this with Dr. Ray. Uh, he mentioned earlier that 
the cost, the production, and the, the taste, and the yield of golden rice compared to ordinary varieties is, is just the same as the, the ordinary variety where it is where the trait is placed. There is a question here uh, about the cost per bag of seed. I assume it will assume I assume that it will be the same as the ordinary, right? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if you still have questions, please feel free to send them and we'll try to uh, farm them out to our speakers and hopefully uh, facilitate a way for them to, to answer your questions. No? Uh, but before we close this webinar, may I request uh, a, a short takeaway message or some closing from our speakers. First with Dr. Howdy. I, you know, in my in my slides, I described the reach of biofortification to 63 countries, and all of that was through conventional plant breeding. Um, but I've also published a paper in the last few months, which was also cited that uh, we can really multiply the impact of biofortification if we can use transgenic technologies, use GMOs. It's really um, it's really holding back the impact of biofortification not to use the GMO technologies. And the reason is, is because of all the strict regulations that go on. Yet all the, uh, all the academies of science around the world have said that it, there's no danger to the, to the environment, that GMOs, all the evidence is that GMOs are safe. In fact, I think it's something like nine or 11% of all agricultural land on the globe are planted to GMOs or planted to transgenics. Um, so the science, the scientists say it's safe, and yet there's this fear, which is which is really too bad. Um, the scientists say that climate change is happening, and there are some people who deny that climate change is happening. The scientists say that vaccines are good for public health. And there are people that, that think, you know, that are afraid of vaccines. The scientists say that GMOs are safe. And yet there's, uh, you know, there's fear out there about GMOs and that's too bad. Uh, but they, they can, this technology can do so much good. We can have a rice that's high in iron, high in zinc, high in vitamin A. Um, and, uh, you know, we could do so much to reduce these deficiencies through public health, through rice. And so I, you know, I very much hope that uh, golden rice in the Philippines will lead the way for the, for the whole world, really. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howdy. Uh, Dr. Martin? Thank you, Jerome. Uh, maybe my last few words would be, the captain of the ship actually is the, is the government. And it's actually them that we need to provide basic information for them to really understand what people are doing to address the problem of the, of the country. They should think of these uh, initiatives as investment and as savings rather than expense. And I think the most important likewise is the value of social behavioral change communication to address some taboos and norms that actually inhibits us to access nutritious food. If we influence them from different levels, we, say, we, we call it syndicated messaging. And even the involvement of the media, definitely everyone will change. Behavioral change is really a big problem to solve and it will really take some time. And uh, one of the things that WFP is also currently doing is the current study with uh, our service provider on climate change and food security. We would like to look at what's the effect of climate change on livelihood and crops in the next 30 years, 50 years down the line in order to support the government in future programming. So we also should not forget supporting our small scale farmers because definitely they are in the front lines. They are the ones actually who are suffering a lot because of the climate change. And it's only in the Philippines, I think, and I think it's also true in some other Southeast Asian countries that our farmers are the people who belong also to the, to the most vulner, vulnerable and impoverished population. In European countries, when say you are an ag agriculturist, you are actually high, uh, belonging to the higher echelon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for those words. Now, Dr. Ray. Yes, um, 
I think this pandemic situation or the COVID the COVID nineteen situation that we have is an open eye opening eye opener rather sorry to the importance of biotechnology for the whole world, um, not just for health but also for biotechnology. And with golden rice, we are offering a sustainable form of rice that can provide us with additional sources of beta carotene. And I hope that uh, this product will move swiftly through the regulatory process. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to get your support in our application for commercial propagation by sending in your letters of support to the BPI director through BPI Biotech Secretariat at uh, gmail.com and also support us in our social media platform at uh, Golden Rice PH on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I hope that uh, with the regulatory approval, uh, we can provide better nutrition to those most in need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. Um, I, we noticed that there are additional questions on Facebook. We'll try to respond them or perhaps ask our speakers to, to check them later on. Uh, I'd like to pick up what Dr. Ray has mentioned, that this pandemic has opened our eyes to the need to have a better program to be food secure, food and nutrition secure. And today, dear friends, we saw through the presentations of Dr. Howdy, Dr. Martin, and Dr. Ray, how biofortification offers us um, we, we saw the, the science-based evidence. Uh, we saw the process that uh, these products go through so that they'd be able to deliver effective, safe, and nutritious uh, products that for, for us, for the consumers, for farmers and farming families, and especially those who, uh, the poor, or uh, especially those who are poor, who are finding it more difficult to gain access to a more balanced and nutrition diet. Now, we saw this in the graphs that Dr. Howdy uh, presented earlier. So we share uh, Dr. Martin's and Dr. Ray's um, uh, call, uh, so, as well as Dr. Howdy's, uh, in, in advocating for biofortification to address our food and security, uh, food security uh, challenges. On behalf of Sterka, which is led by our director, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, we'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Howie uh, Ruiz, Dr. Martin Pereño, and Dr. Ray Ordonio for joining us today. It has been a true pleasure to have you with us for this learning experience. I'd like to invite everyone to have a virtual round of applause to our panelists for this morning. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you soon. Before we end, may I now call on Dr. Ronan Sagado, the Chief of the Development Communication Division at uh, the Philippine Rice Research Institute, WebIC. Ronan? Hi, good morning. Magandang uh, umaga po sa ating lahat. I've noticed that we have um, diverse participants from across the country as far as Kamigin, Tacloban, and Leyte, and also from abroad, from Myanmar. So good morning. So first of all, on behalf of uh, CIRCA, ERI, and BCP, Biotech Coalition of the Philippines, we would like to thank everyone for participating in this uh, first SOLD seminar this year. Uh, that was a very insightful and uh, interesting discourse on the role of biofortification in addressing food and nutrition in insecurity. Um, I'm trying to pull up my PowerPoint presentation. I think something is something is wrong. But um, anyway, so just to um, summarize, our three able resource persons have uh, generously shared with us their extensive knowledge and experience on the subject matter. Howdy, for instance, uh, highlighted the significance of biofortification work in agri-food system around the world, uh, particularly in the 60, 63 countries he mentioned. 
And then uh, Dr. Pareño has kept us abreast on the nutrition status and interventions in the Southeast Asia, particularly in, in the Philippines. And then lastly, Dr. Ordonio has given us updates about the golden rice. So we hope um, that uh, we have shed light on the subject matter and that you have gained clear understanding and appreciation of the importance of the role of biofortifications in advancing agri-food system. And as discussed by our resource per person, particularly Dr. Ardonio, golden rice, a product of biofortification, is uh, currently undergoing regulatory approval. And uh, we are actually now at the final stage of the regulatory approval or process towards making the product available to the public, especially to those who need it most. So the successful application will enable fill rice and uh, IRI to proceed with the pilot scale deployment of golden rice to selected communities. And uh, we are currently at the public comment period as mentioned by Doc Gray, which will end on January 19. And this public participation is part of the regulatory process and it is important in uh, the decision-making process. Hence, we make sure that we have engaged various stakeholders to support the applications. And uh, with this, we have run a campaign to raise awareness about the product and gain public support to the application. So you can follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, using the hashtag, it's time for golden rice or golden rice PH or golden rice approved. And we would appreciate, again, as, as mentioned by Dr. Ordonio, that if you could send a letter of support to the director of the DABPI. And uh, we also would like to take this opportunity to, to all those who have in one way or another supported the campaign through giving uh, statements of support and we wish to receive more letters of support. So again, this has been a wonderful and interesting knowledge sharing and learning. Thank you very much for, for to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ronan. Um, you can see here our statements of support. We have here uh, from Edwin Paraluman, Dr. Nina Halos, and uh, Mr. Enrique Cinco. Now, I think uh, there are a lot to be seen in the Facebook page, in the channels of Golden Rice for your information on this product of biofortification. Uh, for our participants, please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within the next 24 hours. Kindly wait for your e-certificate to be issued within one month. Thank you for your understanding and patience. Uh, once again, we thank our panelists and all of you who participated in this morning's learning session. Let us help one another to get through this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that as we go along, we will be able to create a community of better, bigger, and smarter farmers and farming communities. Once again, this is Jerome Baradas wishing you a good day. Stay healthy and stay safe.